Terry Siesla is the Senior Vice President of Scribe EMR, a remote scribing company that provides remote scribing, coding, and a variety of virtual assistant services. Prior to this, he served in various senior medical management positions for several healthcare services and IT vendors. He has also led startups of a medical transcription company as well as a successful venture that delivered artificial intelligence and analytics software to hospitals and physician practices in the form of computer-assisted coding clinical document improvement and revenue cycle management software. Terry served as a healthcare administrator in the U.S. Navy for 20 years, and he possesses a Bachelor of Science degree in healthcare administration from National Lewis University. We talk about the different types of virtual scribes, like the one who works with you contemporaneously versus records the charts and documents after the visit, ones that utilize AI versus not, and how they collect the information and in what types of practices they are most useful. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Terry Cisla, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Dr. Block, uh, pleasure being here. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, Brad, please. I Only my parents call me Dr. Block. Absolutely, Brad. So I've had a bunch of guests on the show that have been on for a number of reasons, but they've they've told me that I need to get a scribe, right? And they've told me all the reasons it's going to add to my efficiency, the doctor-patient relationship and interaction, and it's going to improve my quality of life. Um, needless to say, I still don't have a scribe. So it seems like a virtual scribe would lower the barrier to getting a scribe. So first let's talk about what is a virtual scribe. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's two ways that we we talk about scribes. One, uh, three, three ways, actually. One is onsite uh, where the scribe walks around with a provider has a a laptop or an iPad and, you know, listens to the encounter um, goes room to room. Uh, The second is, is that, uh, is just a remote scribe. And so what we're doing is we use um, a variety of telemedicine platforms. Um, we had been using something called VC, which is uh, an acronym for video C. Uh, you know, it's got all the modern or the, all the, the security protocols required of a telemed application. They just happen to be a part of ours. And, uh, you know, when COVID came about uh, a couple of years back, um, a lot of providers were getting comfortable with Zoom, uh, which is HIPAA compliant. Um, I, one of my customers is Advent Health down here in Florida, and they use Microsoft Teams, which is the old Skype, uh, version, which is now also HIPAA compliant. And then lastly, uh, doxy.me, you know, and, and, uh, the physicians really love that one. I took a peek at it and I thought it was fantastic. Um, so those are the four that we've actually used now. Primarily, we still rely a lot on VC. Um, but we're do what we're doing is, um, on the provider side, it's a, it's a mobile solution. So mobile meaning that the provider has to have a laptop or an iPad. Uh, a lot of folks are using iPad minis, uh, uh, tablets, MacBooks, things like that. And, uh, you know, there's a video on our website and uh, it's a, a family medicine physician down here uh, in Florida with me. Uh, he uses a cart on wheels. Uh, so he puts the laptop right on the cart, has a little microphone uh, that helps pick up on the audio and, and, and increases the, the fidelity and the quality of the conversations. Um, and, and so we're making a connection that way uh, from the scribe to um, the provider. They both have this telemedicine. Um, so the scribe calls the provider. Um, simultaneously, they're in whatever EMR. Uh, and for us, we're up over 25 EMRs, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, we have credentials right into the EMR. And so um, you know, the, the provider walks into the room with the with that device, sets it down, or if it's a car on wheels, wheels it in. Um, basically says, hey, I, you know, I have a scribe with me on my computer. They're listening in so I can focus uh, exclusively on you and not have to worry about the EMR. And as patients, we all know exactly what that provider is saying because that's just the way it is now is you just, uh, you know, your provider is so, uh, so focused on listening to you but adding in uh, to the EMR. And so... Thirdly, is this virtual scribe. Uh, and so I, I think it's just a, a play on words that 
Um, you know, I'm virtual right now. I work from home virtually. Um, and uh, oftentimes, a couple of years back, uh, some of my guys and I, we, we wondered if we should even use the term virtual scribe. Uh, but, you know, especially post-COVID, I mean, everybody's virtual. Um, so in my world, virtual means remote. Um, however, you know, uh, there is artificial intelligence out there. And I, I can, you know, we can talk about that a little bit further. But does, does that seem to answer the question? Yeah, so we're using the term right now, virtual scribe to, I think you put it really well, it's, it's a remote scribe. Mm -hmm. Like we're working remotely, we're not working virtually. It's not virtual reality. I think virtual really sounds more like your scribe is AI, um, although we I think we all understand it to mean that it's that that it's really remote. But just for for simplicity's sake, we'll keep using the word virtual. But what we really mean is is remote, right? Um, and so in your platform is the well, talk to us about the the workflow, right? Like, is it recorded, and then the scribe takes the note later, or or is the is it happening contemporaneously? Yeah, so, you know, from a setup perspective, uh, you know, usually, uh, a, you know, about a six week uh, setup, somewhere between four and six weeks, it really depends on the customer and, you know, the size of the customer and, you know, and the folks in IT, you know, they have so many plates spinning all the time. Um, so, so we, you know, we get that all taken care of um, to, um, to actually, you know, to the point where we're going to go live. Um, even when we go live, you know, it's still a crawl, walk, run. It's just not something that you just light off and flip a switch and you're start, you know, your scribe is starting to scribe for you. That that's just not possible. So um, one of the things that we're doing or the many things we're doing um, during the implementation process is discovery. So we're looking at, first of all, from the enterprise level, um, you know, uh, what were we here for in the first place? You know, what are we after? What are the, some of the strategic objectives of the customer? Because we want to make sure that, hey, if we're focusing on RVUs, then, you know, uh, once we get up and running, you know, every quarter, we're going to have a meeting and we're going to make sure that the RVUs are increasing or the, the visits per day are increasing, things like that. But then we get into the more granularity of it, and that is each provider. So uh, we conform to the provider. So uh, we're looking at things in the EMR like, uh, templates um, that the that the providers are using, uh, dot phrases, shortcuts, macros, abbreviations. How do you want this set up? You know, because uh, we set it up the way the providers do. To clear, you know, really what we're doing is stepping right in and taking over everything. So, so like I said, once we're ready to go, um, uh, first week, uh, the first day actually, um, the project manager on our side will make the the first introductions. Make sure that the two the scribe and the provider connect with each other uh, through the telemed, uh, let them talk for a little bit. And then uh, the provider will then share his or her screen with the scribe and, uh, and start seeing patients. Uh, and so when it's appropriate, uh, the scribe will ask some questions. You know, like I saw you used uh, the, this, uh, you know, chronic sinusitis template, I would have thought you used, you know, the acute, acute sinusitis, you know, and little things like that. So they're always um, looking for um, clarification. Um, usually somewhere on the middle of day two, the scribe will say, okay, I'd, I'd like to start doing every other visit. Uh, so the scribe does one visit in, in the EMR and the, um, the provider does the other. And it progresses through that first week um, till uh, usually in a family medicine, pediatric primary care environment, by the end of the first week, um, the scribes are doing 100% of the charting. Um, some of the surgical services, uh, orthopedics, uh, GI, you know, where, where the folks are not in clinic every day, all day, uh, that kind of cuts into that time that the scribe spends with the provider. So usually by the mid-second week uh, of service, um, you know, the scribes are able to start charting uh, 100%. 100% at the time of the visit, because one of the things that I'm wondering about is, you know, so my patients leave with, uh, this is my personal workflow, I dictate and I try to do this, I don't do this with everybody, uh, mm -hmm. but I try to dictate a summary of the visit in the patient plan. It's a prose summary of like, you have acute on chronic sinusitis, we're treating you with this antibiotic and this steroid and this nasal rinse, and we're talking about a CAT scan and we're considering surgery if this doesn't work, right? So then um, here's a list of risks of that surgery that's attached. 
for you to review and we'll talk about it further if we decide to pursue it, right? So their patient's getting that at the time of the visit. Are the scribes getting the, the entirety of the visit done by the time the patient leaves? In most cases, um, it, you know, it just depends on complexity. Okay, so same as me in most in most cases, yeah. but not all the time. Okay, so you know, usually um, we're closing charts, or the, we're not, but the provider has to close the chart out. But ninety five percent, ninety five to one hundred percent of charts are closed every day. Uh, we don't hit one hundred percent because there could be a lab pending or a study pending or something. We just can't close it, or the doctor can't close it, or the provider. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, one of the things that we we do as well is um, usually about an hour before the first patient. Um, the scribe's going to get into the EMR uh, and they're going to chart prep. So they're looking at, um, you know, the schedules, they have access to that. Uh, they're looking at new patients versus follow-ups. And if it's a new patient, uh, do we have everything we need? Uh, if it's a follow-up, what did we do last time? So did we do, uh, you know, a CT of the sinuses or something like that? And so they'll start to build the encounters for the day. Um, so some of what you had just talked about, they'll be able to push it right to the provider uh, so that he or she can see the CAT scan. And so, um, but, you know, one thing, uh, I remember when I first started doing demos, you know, so I would get a scribe on the call with me and I would have a physician or a provider on the other end. Uh, a lot of times it might be two doctors, you know, and they goof around and they, you know, they're really funny about things like that, you know, they are. But anyways, um, what I really would have to tell these guys is, you know, this scribe is going gonna, is gonna to scribe what you're saying. This is not dictation, um, you know, because dictation, you can just roll. And on the other end, if it's speech recognition or if there's a transcriptionist, that the transcriptionist has the ability to slow that voice down. You know, they have foot pedals and such. So you can really understand it and take your time and, and type it all out, um, you know, uh, because that, that just seemed to be the default when I get providers on. They just want to start dictating. And, and scribing is not dictating. It's, you know, if you are seeing a patient and, you know, how are you doing today? What's going on? While you're talking and while the, the, the patient is talking, that's when we're putting everything into the electronic medical record. Um, so let's say, you know, you're going to do a, 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 an exam. So you look in the right ear. So you got to grab the otoscope. While you're doing that, the scribe is still charting away, you know, catching up. You look in the right ear uh, and you just tell the scribe, you know, the right ear looks good. And then you got to pick the otoscope over the top of the head. You got to come around the exam table. You know, this is when the scribe is doing these things, keeping in mind you have templates, you know, that may already say within normal limits. Uh, but left ear, you know, uh, is bulging. And we, you know, we've got some erythema in there. So maybe we've got some otitis. Um, and the scribe is listening, you know. And uh, so there are times um, uh, where the scribe can, can play that catch up. So I hope my point's coming across. It's not dictation. Um, you know, I have, uh, I have a orthopod out in, in uh, Northern Louisiana. He likes to see four patients and then, then come out of the fourth and then dictate to a scribe, to a live person. And that's like drinking out of a fire hose, you know? Uh, so, you know, it's problematic, uh, but you know, that's the way he's going to do it. And that's the way we're going to, you know, we're gonna do everything to accommodate. Um, and so, well, that's because that's the habit that that particular person has built mm -hmm. from, you know, doing it the previous way, there's probably a better way for that person to do it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like you can't teach an old dog new trick. Well, you know what? Might be time to teach that old dog a <laughs> yeah. new trick and, you know, and, and have it do, because the workflow might, rather than taking a pause, having it all happen at the same time, then you don't have to pause, come out of the room and do all four, have it happen. You know, that's the, that seems like the whole idea here. Is you're doing it while it happens you know the way i see it happening is you know the patient gives me the history and then i uh, I'll, I'll i'll say um can you put in the template for a normal visit because when i look in everyone's ear nose and throat i'm doing the same exam uh, maybe i'll do a little more of a neuro exam on a dizzy patient or something like that but and then i'll say like right here you know i'll just if there's an abnormality fine you know, septums deviated to the left some pearl into the middle meatus you know rotational transient nystagmus with dix hall pike to the left um but it seems pretty easy to just pull up a template if we're doing the same exam every time now in different specialties that might not happen i guess right yeah and i, and I think that kind of coincides you know like like a lot of times uh, i get asked you know what about coding um, you know, and the scribes aren't coders, um, 
but over time they 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 know enough to be dangerous you know they're never going to debate an e&m level uh with a provider but you know they get to know uh the, the codes you know I, I know there's 80 some thousand codes now however you know icd-10s but um no matter the practice your your code sets are finite you know there's a limited yeah. number of codes you're using so they get to know it you know they get to know also as as physicians we tend to use the same codes over and over again right mm -hmm. like we we like i might choose like if a patient comes in with a tympanic membrane perforation and drainage from the ear i might choose otorrhea i might choose tympanic membrane perforation i might choose conductive hearing loss so i could choose any of those we probably have the habit of doing the same things over and over um mm -hmm. so so I, I you know this so the scribe would be able to learn our habits so the question is do you get the same scribe every time then so that they can learn your habit and your way of doing things and what you have a tendency to see yeah absolutely um you know there are vendors out there um that for whatever reason um, the provider calls the scribe desk um, and then whatever scribe is next um you know on the bench that's who you work with for the day and th that is just absolutely setting up for failure um you know and and it's it's paramount that you work with the same person every day um you know i often make the comment lately that um that the scribe and the provider um are with each other more than the provider is with their spouse or their partner or significant they really are eight and a half nine hours a day they're with each other uh you know talking scribing you know that just coincides with how well the scribe gets to know the provider what if the scribe really doesn't like me? Ah, I've had the opposite <laughs> of that, you know? So now, now the, the scribing world, um, by and large, is um, offshore, you know? So you'll have the Philippines, India. Um, and uh, so there are times, certainly, when, you know, accents become an issue. Um, I've not had a scribe not like somebody, you know? <laughs> I have had providers. Please not verbalize it. Well, I'm sure that there's feelings. Um, but, uh, that guy's a jerk. <laughs> I don't want to work with him again. Yeah, I'm I'm sure of that. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, these are professionals. This and and the one thing with uh, when you get in, you know, with with what I do is uh, these are professional scribes. This is what they do for a career. You know, they're not gap year students. They're not waiting to get into PA school. Uh, you know, I just did a presentation yesterday down in new orleans and uh, it's the same thing you know uh what's going on well you know we're using this service and all of the scribes are all of a sudden suddenly going to school now you know so now it's the revolving door um but uh yeah so primarily going to be offshore um it, you know my organization scribe emr we're up to uh 25 us based now and it looks like we're going to go to 35 to 40. um we just signed university of kentucky last week um so anyways, uh, there sometimes whole university, like a department or the entire university, internal medicine, the medicine, internal medicine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but, but, uh, um, you know, there are still folks out there obviously where, um, you know, to, to send things offshore is just prohibitive. Are, are you seeing this more in any particular specialty? Are you seeing buy-in more in internal medicine? You mentioned GI orthopedics, internal medicine, who, who's really got the most buy-in? uh family medicine um you know peds family medicine because they're really you know they're in the grind monday through friday in that clinic you know charting 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 at least you get to go out and you know into the, go to the operating room take yeah. out some earwax yeah <laughs> yeah so let's say the the patient has you know they come in with pain and they're pointing to the area right does the scribe is there a video camera where the scribe can see what the patient's doing or the physician has to say scribe the patient was pointing to their left knee yeah so interestingly um we gray out the video um we we just don't think it's necessary now i do have some providers that um you know like their scribe to be introduced to everybody in the hallway and so they'll flip on you know the the telemed real quick i have a scribe down in uh, coral springs florida that um, they put the ipad uh, at the lunch table in the break room every day and they all eat lunch together um in fact you know and she you know it's a cute story because she's in india and her name is rashmi but um 
uh, the kids love it. You know, it's a pediatrician. And, uh, you know, one day, uh, Dr. Ashley Bear down there, she said that, um, you know, uh, she was talking to her scribe on her iPad and the scribe said something back and the, you know, the child like was stepped back a little bit and said, whoa, <laughs> is that Alexa? And she said, oh no, Rashmi is much better than Alexa. Um, <laughs> but what they ended up doing is in the corner of the waiting room, uh, they put a globe and a little pin uh, in Bangalore, India, where Rashmi is, and they have a big photo or big poster board of her and the, the things she likes to eat and, you know, little things about her. So the kids just eat it up. That's great. That's great. Um, so some of the, so I looked, but before I interview, I looked into some of the other scribe companies. And so there's, there are some differences out there, right? We mentioned that you, they're live with, with scribe EMR with other companies, they are recorded and then sent kind of like, you know, the way I dictate now, I dictate and talk to text that happens in my computer immediately, as opposed to putting it in a little uh, dictaphone and then someone ends up typing it up later. So what are the advantages of doing it, or maybe even disadvantages of doing it uh, contemporaneous versus recorded? Well, um, you know, one of the, the advantages is that we, uh, in the plan, we queue up medications, you know, so we're doing the diagnosis. Uh, if you if you tell the diagnosis, you know, we're going to go into the MR, select that, you know, does its crosswalk over to the ICD-10 code or whatever the CPTs, you know, whatever we're doing. Um, but we're also going to queue up medications, uh, lab requests, CAT scans, you know, if we can print a, a, a school visit note for a PEDS patient to print her number two somewhere, um, we'll do it because we're there to really take that whole administrative burden off the clinician and allow you folks to be clinicians. So when you get into the recording of things, number one, now you have to have a data center. Number two, now you have to have all the all of the uh, requirements that go along with it, you know, your SOC and SOC 2 and uh, all of these different security, uh, you know, measures that, you know, put in place and data destruction, data at rest, you know, um, but, I, you know, I, to me, the, the whole recording is, uh, number one, you, now you're waiting for it to be done. So now my charts are still open versus closed. Um, and then you lose that ability to, uh, you know, to actually put in pieces of it um, in real time. So if they're the one on the EMR and I've just, so do I, do I have access to the EMR at the same time? Yes, because at least for us, you can't alter the chart from two different places at the same time. Right. Um, most EMRs, you can be in the same section, but the last one out um, is who gets their their data saved. So you ha you do have to be very careful. Does that make sense? Well, so sometimes what I'll do, right, uh, if I'm prescribing a medication, I'll want to know if there are any drug interactions. But if it's not me on the EMR. You know, I'm relying on them to see the alert, but a lot of times it's like, oh, this interacts with their inhaled albuterol, like right, like not, an interaction that's actually not going to be a problem. And then, you know, they might, oh, well, doctor, it looks like there's a drug interaction here. Like, how does that transpire? Well, that's you know, that's one of the things uh, that's between scribe and provider. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that a lot of providers would. Um, you know, have their scribe do that kind of work, but um, you mean the, so the doctor's still prescribing the medication? Yeah. So I mean, they'll queue it up. I'm sorry that that we'll we'll queue it up, but we don't hit send. You know, that's the one thing, one and only thing we don't do. No, yeah, um, you're right. You can't. You right. shouldn't. You shouldn't be able to have those privileges. Right. Yeah, because then you're prescri you're <laughs> practicing medicine. Yeah. As a scribe, but every yeah. every you know, every scribe note um, has an attestation that you know this was scribed by you know whatever the person's name is, but but ultimately it has to be closed uh, by a provider. The chart note. Okay, so the the scribe has written now written the chart note right. They dictate they they wrote the history as the patient was saying it. Wrote some of the the physical exam as the physician was dictating it out loud, and then the patient so. So then the doctor tells the patient what the plan is, and then the, the scribe writes the plan in that section as the physician saying it. Yes. And yeah. then the physician like executes on ordering the imaging and the, phys and, the, um, and the medications, and then the provider, the physician closes out the- The note. 
the note. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. I can't, I, I, I shouldn't say provider. There are some physicians that are offended by that. Well, I only say Off provider topic. because I have PAs and nurse practice. Yeah, PAs and MPs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're all we're all providers. That's yeah. I'm, I think it's I think it's personally I think it's silliness that we yeah. get so offended by by well, by stuff like that. Yes, we're different, but that's you know, there's creep, there's a specialty creep that happens. So <laughs> um and 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 which is a problem. So okay. So um okay, so then so then you've hit send on your medications we closed out and now the patient gets their medications and this and so 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 the thing that's really the time saver is you don't have to independently write any of that stuff and document your physical exam but the stuff that you're maybe not saving time on is the ordering the medications and ordering the imaging and then you got to you know review the note before you close it out you know um i mean working with a scribe um is just like working with uh, an executive assistant um and, and if you if you don't work with that person and explain, you know, exactly how you like things done and reinforce it, you know, and, and have that feedback, um, then they're not going to learn. So if you spend time with a scribe explaining what you had just said about drug interactions and things like that, they'll do it, you know, eventually, yeah. you, you know, you'll get to the point where you know that, that they're doing it correctly. So, yeah. you know, so scribing, you know, up front can be... Uh, a little disruptive. Um, you know, you have a doc that's, you know, got to see 25 patients. Now I got to scribe, you know, and so it could be a little stressful, but, but so worth it. Yeah. It was the same thing when we adopted our EMR, right? You have to start out. We started out doing two patients an hour and then we were able to ramp up from there. Mm -hmm. But uh, ultimately, at least with ours, it, it's, it's a big time, you know, between dictating and templates, that was a big time saver. So this will be even an even bigger time saver. So, so the other thing that I realized about some of the scribes, you mentioned it earlier, is some of the virtual scribes are actually at least partially virtual. So can you speak to the role of AI in virtual scribes? Sure. So, uh, you know, I've had an opportunity to, to see DAX. Um, and uh, I've spoke to the folks at DeepScribe, which is another AI platform. Um, but I've also had the opportunity to work for an AI company. So before I did this, uh, I worked for a, a company called EZDI. And uh, so it was more along the lines of computer assisted coding, uh, clinical, you know, CDI, uh, uh, and uh, all kinds of, you know, big data, big data analytics, things like that. So, um, when you, when you, you know, when you look at AI, um, there's some things that it has to do um, that I don't feel we're quite at that point technologically yet. So um, first of all, you have to have speech recognition, right? So, so something's got to listen to what you're saying and, and the patient and a pediatric, you know, and a child, maybe a 10 year old uh, take, um, you know, the, what we call the ambient conversation uh, you know, what needs to go in, what's important, what needs to go into the record, uh, distinguish between the different voices, which, you know, I'm not saying that that's not a capability, um, but what's difficult is, um, you know, I, re I remember having something called uh, section analysis. And so, um, you know, we were using five different or six different technologies uh, organically wrapped into a night. It was a beautiful platform, but uh, the section analysis allowed us, allowed the, the, the engine to decipher exactly what, maybe kind of what, what kind of report this is. So it could look at it and say, oh, this is an H&P, you know, uh, or it can say, this is an app note. It, and, and this piece, this is H&P stuff. It should be over here. Um, but anyways, you know, you have to have um, something that deciphers the different voices. So you have to have that voice recognition technology. Take the different voices, put it into different text, um, recognize what, 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 what is this, you know, is this, this is a physical exam or is this a, a patient talking about their history or the mom's talking about the child, you know, fell out of the tree uh, and put that all into a logical manner and then take these little snippets of information and somehow move it through an EMR into the right spots. <laughs> And then don't, you know, and then you still, you have to throw in a template. Now, now how does that work? You know, so, you know, um, the companies that, that are, that are, you know, offering that kind of solution right now, you have to have a very tight relationship with, with an EMR company 
In fact, all of them. So you have to have ECW, Epic for sure, um, because how is how is that application going to maneuver through these EMRs? So, and, and I'm saying this because I've talked to physicians and they've said, tried it, didn't work. And I'm not going to say which one's which, but, you know, it just didn't work. And so now I'm calling you. And uh, so, I, I mean, I think, uh, I remember when SpeechRec really kind of first came out, uh, I started getting, you know, introduced to it in about 2000, uh, wasn't ready yet, um, but come about, 2008 boy all of a sudden it really worked in radiology you know limited you know there's like i guess 5,000 some odd words that are used in radiology right and so you, you know eventually um the engines picked it up and and, and did a really nice job and, and now it's actually very good so i i like to think that we're probably five to eight years away from something that can actually recognize um all the different voices and the semantics in, and put it into the right spot in emr for me Personally, if anyone, any developers are listening, all I need to improve my efficiency is be able to order stuff with my voice. Like I can use my dictaphone and say, uh, cat scan of the sinuses, non-contrast, augmentin 875, POBID, you know, send it to the pharmacy, uh, you know, whatever it is that I'm ordering, I need to be able to order it at the rate that I can dictate, like the physician that you mentioned, like at mm. dict at dictation rate, I need to be able to tell them, uh, insert the template for the normal physical exam, change the following, and then, and then great. And now my, my chart note is, uh, is done much, much faster rather than all the clicking. So it does all that, you know, all that, all that force in the rate that I say it and not necessarily, there can be a little delay. I order that stuff. And then, you know, by the time I go to the next room, that, that stuff. So any developers out there, mm -hmm. if you can plug that into the, uh, into the EMR, um, then that would be that would be a big help. Um, so what about billing and coding? Are the scribes or not necessarily the scribes because they are not certified billers and coders, but is that a service that you provide someone to review the notes and do the coding for the physician? You know that and that's come about um, a, a couple of times in the last few weeks, actually. And it just came about this week where, you know, folks are asking for like a hybrid, like a scribe that can also code. I mean, we're entertaining it. And, and like I said earlier, you know, the scribes aren't coders, but they know enough to be dangerous. You know, they know yeah. codes eventually, you know, after it's not um, that complicated anymore. They took out the physical no. exam and they took out the history. Now it's yeah. just, it's just medical decision-making, decision which is not simple, but it's yeah. not as complicated as it once was. Yeah. And also we all, we tend to do the same things over and over. So once your scribe gets to know the physician well enough, Okay, they did this again. Okay, they did that. I know what the code for this is going to be. I know what the code for this is going to be. So, I mean, we as the physicians could just learn it better. But, you know, for those who haven't, I think yeah. it would be a, a useful service. Yeah. And and the scribes, they do get to that point, though. Um, yeah. But like you said, you know, ENMs and MDMs, no, they're not going to do that. But um, so what we end up doing is, uh, you know, we have uh, a coding service. So we, you know, scribe during the day and then overnight. Uh, these folks are coding and dropping the bills by, you know, 7.30 the next morning. Yeah, yeah, no, but that, okay, so that is, I mean, that doesn't happen, have to happen at mm -hmm. the same time. Patients want their notes, but you don't necessarily have to code it at mm -hmm. the same time. So it is something that you provide, it's just a different individual that does it. Right, yeah. Great, great. Anything else you want to tell? Uh, so Terry Cisla of Scribe EMR, scribeemr.com is where we find you. Anything else that you want to tell our audience? Yeah, you know, I just, uh, you know, I remember talking to folks, um, you know, as I when I first came to this organization, and it just felt like nine out of 10 times this works, you know. Um, and so we finally ran the numbers. And sure enough, 91.4% retention. Uh, so it is truly nine out of 10 times, you know, it doesn't work for everybody. Some, some doctors, they just really want to do it themselves. Um, but I know that, uh, you know, as of today, I have 856 uh, providers on service. I do not have one doctor, not one provider, um, calling me saying, Terry, I'm still at home charting. You know, that's over. And, you know, you, you guys, you, you know, you physicians, you're not allowed to be foot baseball coaches and things like that. How the heck could you do that? And, you know, this is this is one way to kind of get some of your life back. Yeah, one of the major, one of the major, we've called, we've talked about this on a number of episodes. One of the major causes of burnout is the EMR. So you yeah. take that away and also mm -hmm. administrative burdens can be you know 
charting is one of those. So there's some overlap there with those two causes of EM of uh, of, of burnout. So mm-hmm. get get yourself a virtual scribe, a remote scribe, whatever you want to call them. Thanks again, Terry, for uh, okay. for coming on the show. All right, thanks, Brad. Thanks for having me. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.